positions. You may kindly raise questions, if any, through the chat box. The total duration of the event is slated to be 90 minutes. Interpretation facility in French and Spanish language may be availed by selecting the relevant channel from the options at the bottom of your screen. The webinar is being recorded and also being live streamed on ISA social media channels. The link to live stream of the webinar will be available on ISA website and YouTube channel for future reference. We request you to kindly keep your mics on mute while discussion is in progress. So without any further delay, we now move on to the inaugural session. Uh, His Excellency Dr. Ajay Mato, the Honorable Director General of the ISA is unfortunately currently in travel. Uh, but has kindly sent a recorded welcome address. I request our IT team to kindly play back Honorable DG's address. Very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, or a good morning or a good evening, depending on where you are. It is wonderful to have you all with us on the occasion of this uh, seminar series on e-mobility, focusing on vehicle-integrated PV panels. The International Solar Alliance is an intergovernmental treaty-based organization which has to date 109 countries who have signed our framework agreement. We look forward to enhancing the deployment of solar energy across all our member countries. As far as our e-mobility program is concerned, we look forward to working with our member countries on seeing how we can create the ecosystem which helps in creating the environment for the greater uptake through charging stations, through the charging of the charging stations, through solar panels, through solar electricity, so that in the end, the available charging is through solar electricity and not through fossil electricity. We understand that this is a challenge and therefore we look at, at technological models and business models which can make this happen. Now, solar charging can occur through an open access mode or through on-site PV panel installation uh, enabled by uh, uh, EV charging uh, of uh, battery, uh, battery charging stations. We covered those things in an earlier webinar on charging for change. Today, we are looking at the issue of PV panels being integrated directly onto the vehicles itself uh, through the technology called as VIPV, uh, Vehicle Integrated Photovoltaic uh, Technology. This is the theme of today's webinar. Now, this is an area which is still in a stage of evolution and therefore what we can do, what we can think, what are the kinds of demonstrations we do, the knowledge that we gain would help us in enabling this to come into place in the years to come. There are also regulatory issues. For example, what would be safe requirement in terms of vehicles uh, as far as PV integration is concerned? what would be the level of charges, what would be the kinds of safety and many other such issues which will need to be developed together with regulators, uh, particularly of vehicles in the all our member countries. We therefore propose to create a, pla a platform to enable partnerships to form and joint ventures between governments between industries and between financial investors. This will provide support for building the infrastructure that is needed and for a range of projects, a project pipeline to develop so that we can draw the investor community into this area as well. Obviously, what the International Solar Alliance built to the, brings to this table apart from this platform is the linkage with the photovoltaic sector in the countries because at the end of the day we do realize that the country regulations will be a major factor in determining how the technological trajectory of the IPV will develop in the years to come. 
Um, another major issue which we also look forward to addressing through the platforms is the kind of capacity building. We understand capacity building today more in an information dissemination and information provision context. But as time goes by, we will develop uh, the kinds of demonstration programs which help us identify key issues technology, where is it that we can get this in, issues related to financing, issues related to regulation. We hope that these series of interactions would help us develop and deliver the kinds of capacity building needs that are put up. Finally, what I, the, the last point that I would like to stress is that as we move ahead on this we are delighted that we are partnering with the Asian Development Bank through the ISA ADB Technical Knowledge Support and Technical Assistance Program and we hope that this would help us create the kinds of information and the kind of next steps that can help us move these in various countries, particularly in the Asian region. I would like to thank all the speakers who are with us today and I thank you all the participants for being with us for this webinar and in our future endeavors. I thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you, sir, for your kind remarks and uh, providing a broad strategic context to the ISA's offerings in this segment. Uh, as Honorable DG has uh, highlighted ADB support to the ISA Secretariat under its various programs, uh, including the Solar E-Mobility Program, uh, I am pleased to invite Mr. Jeevan Acharya, Principal Energy Specialist, Asian Development Bank, to set the context for the event, including his ISA ADB collaboration under the program. Mr. Acharya is a key member of ADB's Energy Sector Group and Climate Change Team and is serving as a focal person for regional cooperation and integration for energy in South Asia. Over to you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Kusagar. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of Asian Development Bank, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, second uh, webinar. And uh, Dr. Mathur has very well uh, explained in the context for why we are doing uh, this there are a couple of things from Asian development that I would like to emphasize we cannot just continue the way we have been doing so we need to think outside of the box and try to uh, bring into height in order for us to be able to achieve those climate targets. And this is where uh, this webinar like this, where we are integrating electric, uh, solar panels in the electric vehicles, could be at one area uh, which uh, could have a very high prospects uh, moving forward. But uh, having said that, there are a lot of challenges uh, in, in context uh, like this. And uh, this is where uh, we all need to work together. There we need to work with the governments, regulatory agencies, private sector, civil society organizations, research organizations, financial institutions, uh, and, and also uh, you know, looking at, we need to look, work with the electricity utilities. Uh, we also need to look, uh, work with the municipalities and so on the various stakeholders are needed for any of the uh, initiatives like this uh, to flourish uh, in, in, in many of our countries. Um, from Asian Development Bank side, uh, we have a, one uh, regional technical assistance with the International Solar Alliance. Um, the main objective of that uh, technical assistance is to support, build the pipeline of uh, potential projects in these areas and also look at a very new financial modalities and mechanisms. And early, which is also very important, is in the capacity building. And I really hope that all of you will be able to benefit out of it. From ADB side, I would really like to congratulate ISA for, uh, for, for embarking on technology. Uh, 
on, on, on initiatives like this and also inviting and accepting our invitation and joining, uh, joining this, uh, this this webinar. Uh, as you have seen, the, we have lined up uh, very um, eminent speakers. We have we are bringing wealth of experience uh, in, in various aspects of it, and I'm sure all of you will be eager to listen to them more than listening to me. So, with these uh, few words, I would like to uh, wish all of you uh, all the best for this webinar. And then I reiterate our ADB support and commitment uh, to this sector, to International Solar Alliance, and all of our member countries, and also all all other stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your kind remarks um, and uh, uh, informing us about ADB's priority as well as ISA ADB collaboration and emphasizing the need for broader stakeholder consultation as we move forward in the sector. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Philip Malbranch, Assistant Director General ISA. Uh, Dr. Malbranch, with an experience of over 30 years in the renewable energy sector, was instrumental in establishment of INES, the French Solar Energy Research Institute, and led the institution as its director general before joining the ISA. Uh, so over to you, sir, to uh, provide ISA's perspective on the webinar. Thank you. Yes, yes please. Uh, thank you, Kushaga. So. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Uh, as Dr. Mathieu has already been talking about uh, regulation, uh, um, uh, our precedent speaker, uh, Mr. Akaria, has been telling us about the importance of training all the stakeholders and having all of them uh, involved. I will focus on some technological issues. And I will uh, address uh, two main topics, which are um, the importance of efficiency and the importance of the weight when you are considering uh, integrating PV into, um, into vehicles. You need to, to look really well uh, at these two aspects. Uh, how can I share my screen? Ah, yes. So we just Thank you. So, uh, yes, the uh, first important thing is uh, regarding efficiency is the importance of this uh, uh, electric vehicle technology, which is much more efficient than fossil fuel uh, cars. And uh, second, uh, you can see it here, uh, much more efficient than uh, other fuels. And second thing is uh, PV. Uh, for supplying electricity to electric vehicle uh, takes much less space than any uh, biofuel technology, whether ethanol or other uh, diesel technology. Uh, it's much more efficient. PV is, in terms of uh, land use, is more than 100 times more efficient than uh, biofuel uh, such as uh, ethanol. Second issue, which is important to look at, is the weight, weight of your vehicle. Uh, you will see it later, looking at, uh, here you have various types of uh, vehicles. Uh, vehicles uh, weighing uh, two tons or more than uh, two and a half tons, like uh, Tesla or Audi uh, model, uh, we will never be really supplied with, uh, with solar energy especially with integrated PV. Uh, integrated PV will have an impact on much lighter vehicle, uh, which consume twice less or three times less energy per kilometer. So these are the two aspects I wanted to, to, to stress out. And I will just uh, show you a few, few examples. So uh, 
if you consider one square meter of PV module, it produces uh, on average less than one kilowatt hour per day. Uh, it has uh, this production per year. It means when you consider a motorbike, an Ericsho or a small car, but with that uh, single square meter, you can drive uh, 10, five kilometers per day. With this. Of course, if you need to drive more, you, you need a larger area. So here are just examples about uh, bikes, uh, many types of bikes, uh, cargo bikes, uh, three wheeler like Richo, some are really existing in operation, like here in Noida by Sonron, or over in development. Uh, and plenty of cars now. We have prototype by Zen in France, Sonomotor in Germany, Lightyear in Sweden, Toyota in Japan, etc. So these are the main example. Of course, you can integrate in trucks, in buses. Here you have a view from above. Uh, on trailer, here is a refrigerating uh, trailer uh, where you can go up to 60 square meter providing 10 kilowatt. Uh, and of course, it can go as well on, that's another type of vehicle on, on boats, small individual boats or large uh, passenger boats. We will have more on that later. With that, I conclude. It's the IPV is really relevant for lightweight vehicles, whether it is three wheeler or light four wheelers. It's uh, on average, we can say it's a range extender, which helps you in decreasing the frequency to which you have to, to recharge to go to the charging station. Uh, it's really cost effective for several applications, we will have some examples. It brings you additional functionalities and there's a huge market ahead of us. There are, of course, some remaining challenges about the cost of this integration. It's not just a uh, P panel that you add on a vehicle, it has to be really integrated. And then you end up with some certification issue that we will have to solve as well. With that, I wish you an interesting uh, webinar. And I leave the floor to my other colleagues. Thank you, sir, uh, for your kind remarks. Um, it was a wonderful presentation, providing an overview of uh, techno uh, economic uh, comparison of various vehicle segments and uh, very enlightening. Uh, colleagues, it's a pleasure to welcome Mr. Mahesh Babu, Chief Executive Officer of Switch India and Chief Operating Officer of Switch Global, to deliver special remarks. Reflecting on his vast 25 plus year experience as an industry leader in the mobility sector, Mr. Babu has been instrumental in establishment of Switch Global India and promoting innovations in the e-mobility sector for the Indian market and beyond. He has also worked in various EV committees of central and state governments and various industry associations in India. It is a privilege to have you with us today, sir. Uh, the floor is all yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's, it's my privilege to be with all of you on a dedicated program on solar e-mobility by the International Solar Alliance to support large-scale uptake of solar energy in the EV sector across its 100 plus members. Uh, EV, uh, you know, auto industry has been doing incremental changes on emissions and uh, other, other safety aspects for a, over a century now. Now, but in the last two decades, we have seen substantial disruption, particularly on electric mobility. Uh, India is going to be one of the uh, one of the largest EV market uh, in this decade. India's EV market is expected to grow at a CAGR of forty nine percent between twenty twenty one and twenty thirty. I think which will lead up to about 70 million units of electric mobility available by 2030. Niti Aayog has already shared with us uh, that their ambitious target of 30% electrification in 2017, I think they keep revising upwards when we talk to them now on two wheelers, three wheelers and buses. When I talk about uh, mobility today in India, India is a very vast uh, 
country with multiple model of transport. We have two wheelers, three wheelers, uh, uh, cars, and even large uh, public transport buses. I think when we talk about mobility today, I think we can't uh, uh, remove energy out of it. I think energy and mobility, I would say, is one of the key aspects which are growing in India and which needs attention. How, how can I say uh, that uh, uh, energy and uh, mobility are integrated? Mava Acharya is an example. She is from Power Ministries Division. She is uh, tendering the largest uh, public buses tender and in fact, three-wheeler tender in, in the world as we speak. So uh, power, power, power ministry and power and energy is taking a lead. Uh, why I'm saying so? Uh, why I'm saying so is because Mobility is mobility sector's ultimate aim is net zero. We are not just electrifying for the sake of zero tailpipe emission. If you look at switch, we have a net zero ambitious target. Uh, as a country in India, we have taken an ambitious target of achieving net zero by 2070. And International Solar Alliance plays a very important role. We already have a 500 gigawatt of target by 2030. And uh, integration of all these, uh, all the generation, or I would say renewable energy generation to mobility will play a very, very key role. For example, we are supplying about 300 electric buses to Bangalore. Our intention is to achieve 80% plus solar energy for those charging those buses uh, in uh, uh, in a year time. So we are, we are taking a substantial effort in, uh, uh, achieving a net zero in our operations, both in factory, our vehicles, and also in our supply chain. So if that is so, I think I, uh, International Solar Alliance will play a vital role. And particularly, I'm very, very thrilled about the VIPV concept, uh, which uh, Dr. Philip uh, Malbone has shown today. I think it's very innovative. India is in a very, very innovative uh, position because our car adoption is less our public sector adoption, uh, public transport adoption is less, and our ambition for next uh, uh, two or three decades is very high. And our growth rate is the fastest in the large economies in the world. So if we have to achieve this growth rate, uh, we need to uh, grow its sustainability, both in mobility as well as in energy. And I'm happy that uh, the mobility sector is open to work with uh, ISA, to integrate uh, VIPVs in the vehicle. In the sector which I am in, uh, the, which is uh, large public transport buses, I think it's important that uh, we save energy uh, uh, through uh, VIPVs uh, because you have a large surface on the bus on the top. It has a very good efficiency because the bus is always running around the whole day and we can, uh, the, the type of tenders Mava is giving, uh, with the rates coming out, it will be impossible for us to achieve those economics traditionally. So we will look at much more uh, better economics going forward through innovation and through technology. And that's what I believe that uh, this workshop and uh, um, webinar is going to bring in. And I'm very happy to be part of this and wish all the uh, participants a great uh, day during the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind remarks. And uh, as you have rightly uh, put that electrification of the mobility sector uh, through clean energy sources like solar energy has to be put within the broad co uh, context of climate change mitigation and net zero. And markets like India, developing markets, fast developing are an ideal opportunity for innovative applications such as VIPV and uh, solar integrated uh, uh, charging infrastructure. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have Ms. Mahu Acharya present the keynote address at this important webinar. Ms. Acharya is a renowned global expert with over two decades of experience in green finance, renewable energy, and one of the early pioneers of carbon markets and carbon credit-based impact investment. She has previously held position, uh, position of Assistant Director General at the Global Green Growth Institute and is currently leading the state-owned energy transition company Convergence Energy Services Limited of the Government of India as its Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer. She has led a wide array of global initiatives, 
serves on the boards of multiple international entities and has appeared on international Indian listings of women in leadership. Uh, it's an honor to have you, ma'am. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you to uh, ISA for, uh, for inviting me and to Dr. Bharadwaj for listening to our work in lay. That's really what got started. Uh, and I'll tell you about uh, lay in a second. Um, let me back up a little bit. ISA has, I'm sure you have over 100 uh, countries right now in your membership. And while it was set up with the, uh, with the objective of increasing solar power, I think it's fair to say at that time, this was in 2015 and I was around at the, at the event, it was very much conceived that we would be think we're talking about solar in the power sector and solar for energy and for electricity, largely for electricity. The fact that about not even 10 years later, we're now at a conference talking about solarizing our transport sector just means that not only has the transport sector suddenly picked up, but the fact that solarizing something is normal business. Our, one of our biggest ambitions that was laid out at the, at the COP in Glasgow last year was that a big percentage of our energy use is renewable energy, which means that the energy that is used to to, to make this, this glass here needs to eventually be solarized or made at least green, renewable. So I'm very pleased that we're here. And that just means that our, our job has also become a little tougher. Some years ago, and I know that across many of ISA member countries, I was very involved in the establishment of ISA, that some of us are still at the point of generating additional and increasing our solar power amongst the membership. And while in other countries, from where I sit right now in Delhi, we're thinking about solarizing the transport sector. What that means is we need a, a number of business models on the table. And I think as far as India is concerned, um, this country could share a lot of the experiences, a lot of the troubles, a lot of the challenges, and a lot of the successes we have managed to make solar normal business that we're here with one of the largest uh, bus companies, the largest equipment manufacturers, and we're talking about net zero. We're talking about solarizing our transport sector. So we're talking about business models that are a lot more sophisticated. How do we make solar work over and above our existing physical infrastructure, our existing regulatory infrastructure, and our existing legal infrastructure, because all of that was otherwise created for the use of the electricity sector or the power sector. So what is happening now, and exactly as I was hoping that a little bit at least happen, the Convergence logo, if some of you can would see it at some point, has a battery in the middle. And the idea of a battery is that as we, um, three things start converging. And I realize it's a bit staid, but at that time it was not. We thought it was quite unique to be even calling this convergence. But the idea of a battery is that it is so central to our energy transition. It seems quite staid and quite, um, quite dumb to say it in that sense and quite obvious. But really, if you, talk, if you think about how do I change my legal infrastructure, how do I change my regulatory infrastructure, my policy frameworks, and my physical infrastructure, such that my single battery asset is suddenly the one fulcrum for how we solarize our transport sector. So in our vehicle business, let me put some of this in perspective. We talked about charging stations for cars. Where this discussion came up is up, up in Leh Ladakh. Uh, we have put up a car port, a quote unquote car port. It's solarized, we've got panels, we've got a battery, and we're charging buses and we're charging cars. Those cars are specially designed so that they can operate at those cold temperatures and the battery is, is able to operate without discharging quickly. And the same thing with buses. And it's working, it's working really well. It's even got extra electrons that our next step is to work with the government to see if we can sell the electrons back. Now it's a fully integrated system, which is exactly what I think we were looking to do here. Of course it has challenges. We can't replicate that all over the country, much as I would love to do it, it needs a lot of space. Even in Leh Ladakh, where there is a lot of space, some of our panels are in one place right above the carport, and some have just had to be put somewhere else. 
Now think about our transportation system is coming on top of our cities. And we're retrofitting and retrofitting and retrofitting and retrofitting because we're working on top of an existing infrastructure. So in that sense, some of our regulations in India, and this should be something we should look at, maybe ISA can look at spreading across other countries that are not yet at the stage uh, that they have to finish the power sector discussions with solar and then come to mobility. We don't need to do that. In this country, it just happened like that. But battery prices have come down, business models have, are working. And if you look at the bus sector versus cars, because the bus sector is a lot more impact, has a lot more impact, has a lot more social impact, incredibly more greenhouse gas impact, and it has air pollution, and of course, air pollution impacts. And of course, it's really good because it reduces our fuel bills. But five and a half thousand buses, which is the last tender that we ran, is a little short of 300 megawatts of power, 273 megawatts of power to be exact. We really need to green that and we will green it. Thankfully, now in this country, it's even cheaper to use green power. We may not have to be stationed in the same spot. We may have to use our existing regulatory infrastructure. But even to do that, we've got to make sure that the battery business in there is competitive. And that is a business model we have to crack. Our next target that's been given to us by the government of India is 50,000 electric buses. Uh, I'm, I, I dare not say by when, because whichever year I say I get into trouble and I'm told to, to speed up. But 50,000 electric buses have to be put on the road. And I know it's doable, but 50,000 is three and a half gigawatts of power. And we have only used two models in there of buses in there. Now we have to green that because it would be it would be an opportunity lost if we didn't. Um, it's, it's incumbent on us to do that. And it's also incumbent on us to find as many creative business models, creative financial structures to support this. So to that extent, if we can use carbon credits to manage some of this transition, buy down the cost of the physical infrastructure, regulatory infrastructure doesn't cost anything. It's mostly in our minds. Legal infrastructure yeah, costs a little bit, but I think we can negotiate something with our, uh, our lawyer friends. But what we can't fix too much is the physical infrastructure because you still have to buy the asset. So I just want to put out there that of course we're doing it and we have to use a little bit of our creative energies where the private sector moves a little bit out of their comfort zones and the public sector does the same. And I can very confidently say that at least when it comes to electric buses, electric three-wheelers, both have really come uh, outside their comfort zones and they're moving closer and closer together to create these models because we all need it as a country. We all need it as a society. And I think some of us even need it as a personal contribution to, the, to having done something useful. So on that note, thank you once again for ISA for calling me and I'd, we'd be happy to help wherever we can uh, to spread, spread this. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your kind remarks um, and a very uh, enriching uh, talk. Uh, and uh, it, it's, a, it's um, I mean, uh, the support from the government of India and the experience from India would indeed be very helpful for the ISA to take up to other countries to develop the policy and regulatory infrastructure to integrate solar PV with the uh, mobility sector uh, and uh, we'll uh, count on your support. Uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to the technical session. The two panel discussions will be moderated by Mr. Uh, Sajid Mubashir, Scientist G, Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. Uh, Mr. Mubashir has been a leading figure in developing and managing technology development programs in India over more than two decades. He has been instrumental in development of National Electric Mobility Mission Plan that led to the creation of the famed One National E-Mobility Program in 2015. He has published various technology roadmaps and chaired the section committee on electromobility standards under the Bureau of Indian Standards, which created the full suite of 21 standards for EV charging for the three segments ranging from light EV to heavy duty vehicles. Sir, it is a privilege to have you lead the enriching panel discussions today on technical policy regulatory standards, certification and testing, and techno-economic viability of the VIPV sector. 
I now invite you to kindly introduce the first panel and lead the discussion. The floor is all yours, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, I had some personal uh, confusions and doubt, which got cleared up in the first session. So I'll start from there. So we have about four speakers in this technical session. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Fitsum Deresa, project manager, Green Tech from Ethiopia. He will talk about uh, solar integrated cars, small cars. Then there is Sandit Tandasheri, who will talk about uh, uh, large boats, uh, large ferries uh, in, in uh, southern India. And then Harman Arora will talk about uh, e-rickshaws, again, solar integrated. And Professor Daniel Medeira, perhaps he's uh, you know, going to you know, been not directly participating, but sending a video across. Uh, he can. He has a lot of experience in integration. So we look forward to it. So for, first, uh, before I just kind of, I need to set up a context a little bit. Uh, the speakers here, mostly in terms of vehicles, are going to talk about small EV. And uh, you saw a very clear enunciation by the ADG of uh, ISA, Mr. Philip Melbranch. He talked very specifically about light EVs being the uh, preference. And, and that's my question. I hope that comes out very clearly what, what you're, you know, like what kind of voltage platform, the thing between the light EV and the bigger EV and the biggest one represented by Mahesh Babu just before. Uh, one of that is the voltage, of course, the size and weight. Uh, the size of all that. So how much of percentage of uh, the battery and, and consumption can be met in these three different platforms? My hunch is it is a light EV, which would profitably do that in terms of light e in terms of vehicles. A ferry we don't know yet. I'm waiting to hear. Uh, so it seems uh, people are talking about up to 20, 25 percentage of the requirements being met, whether it's auto rickshaw or e-rickshaw or a, a small car. Uh, but uh, when you look at uh, the bigger ones like a bus, there are examples from Fruffer, uh, which uh, of a, a proper vehicle, 800 volt uh, thing, it's about five to 10 percent you're talking about. So they have specially designed this vehicle. There are issues about all these glass structures out there. But if you look at uh, you know the Indian buses in India, uh, where Dr. Mahavachari talked about it a lot, the design is to push everything onto the roof. Uh, you know, in, in a CNG bus, the CNG cylinders go on the roof. In electric bus, you find the batteries on the roof and other things. So I don't know whether the roof is available for a bus, but certainly in a light EV, uh, like an auto, like e-rickshaw, everything at the bottom, the very low center of gravity, the roof is completely yours. So this is my hunch. I'm waiting to hear. I would invite Mr. Fitsum Teresa to give the first talk. Uh, sir, uh, uh, Mr. Fitzum Garissa seems to be having some uh, technical issues joining the panel. So we may move to the next speaker, Mr. But do you have do you have his presentation? Uh, no, sir, we, uh, we don't have his presentation, so we can move to the second speaker. And in the meanwhile, we'll uh, try to coordinate with Mr. Fitzum Garissa and see if his... All right. Now, before I call Mr. Sandit, I would just like to mention what I gathered, you know, from here, there about Mr. Fitzum de Rezo. These are small cars, very small cars. And it's very particular, important to mention that. These are small cars at low voltage. Uh, if, you, if people in India, a lot of participants are from India, you will see that you'll remember the early cars, the Reva and, the, and then the E2, Verito, three, four cars we had, even one called Tigor, which were running at 72 volts, 48 volts. So he's got these kind of cars in, uh, in, in Ethiopia. And they seem to be doing rather well. The small vehicles with four or five passengers, of course, can get in, but the voltage of the vehicle is low. And I thought I should remark that. Now, uh, Mr. Tandisheri, would you like to talk about your uh, award-winning uh, career, of course, and as well as your uh, uh, the solar ferry, which has made a lot of uh, uh, news. I hope this big plan is up, about 50, 55 are planned. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. I'm just sharing my screen. Can you see it? It's good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you for the introduction. So um, basically, um, now Walt, we are an eco-marine tech company. We are best known for Aditya, but we also do a few other boats in the marine transport, whether it's fishing boat, um, water taxis, Roros, et cetera, or in tourism, et cetera, which I'll talk, I'll focus more on ferry public transport today. 
these are some of the range of boards uh, but let's just to pause on aditya itself it is now operating for five and a half years yeah. now and uh, it has transported almost 2 million passengers yeah. 120000 kilometers travel without a single drop of fuel so it saved almost 192000 liters of diesel which is about 200000 dollars so this is what aditya has done <clears throat> in the last five and a half years and when you speak of carbon it's about 500 tons of carbon in this period so what is different in aditya compared to or a ferry boat compared to evs because you are all familiar with evs so primarily uh, uh, the ev uh, the automobile industry compared with boat building is slightly different uh, because boat building is more fragmented there are smaller players building boats across the world so this means that we also realize that there is a lot of efficiency gap in the design of the boat itself which is not available when you do an ev so in the boats for example uh, when we when we were doing so we realized that uh, by shifting the material property like shifting to composites and aluminum we could reduce the boat weight from 35 tons to 17 ton for this ferry of 75 passenger then the underwater shape which is very crucial typically uh, if you we, we spend almost 6 months to design that underwater shape so we could reduce the drag from about 45 kilowatt to 15 kilowatt and this is when uh, the solar uh, electric is enabled from a very economical perspective and that is a very crucial word because evs are still dependent on subsidies and other schemes from the government whereas if you see public transport ferry boats and solar electric it is not primarily because 70% of the energy and that's a number sri mubashir was asking uh, 70% of the energy is from the sun for a whole year operation if you take like for aditya it's a, it's it's operating um, 7 to 7 uh, at 7 am in the morning to 7 a, pm in the evening 22 trips 3 km so 66 km is operating range with 75 passenger so uh, so why we could do in a boat and we can't do in a bus for instance is we can make the boat bigger than what uh, a normal boat is so which we can do on the water we can't do on the road so our 75 packs is twice as uh, large as in it is which has a uh, size of six buses uh, to mainly primarily without having any impact on the drag six buses to facilitate almost 20 25 kilowatt panels so that was the purpose we done that so that we can keep the battery size smaller to make the whole economics work that's the approach we have tried to do and of course marine standards are much different compared to an ev and we use only lfp chemistry and of course there are other safety standards to follow so this is typically an economics of a ferry boat compared to a diesel ferry boat uh, boat 400000 usd versus 300000 usd with a, with almost a f- annual fuel saving of 35000 liters so depending on the fuel price in the country you represent you can say it's uh, uh, the economics will work so that in a 20 year period it is less than half sometimes even one third depending on the fuel price uh, so that's the total life cycle cost it's about 3 to 4 years break even period and this works in a public transport ferry boat where the asset is heavily utilized in certain applications where the speeds are slightly higher for example island countries where the distance between two islands are longer Uh, instead of six knots which is typically on inland or um, city uh, movement it has to go to around 10 knots so that means 10 knots is almost 18 kilometers per hour so and when you go to the, switch to that speed so the total uh, power uh, is four five times and thereby the energy is also almost 10 times per day operation so there you have to switch from an lfp model to an lto where the battery is designed for each round trip so uh, so and these lto batteries will typically ne- can do charging 15 minutes almost 60% charging so this is a model for a uh, slightly faster ferry boats and these also the economics will work equally well fundamentally it's a cost the cost of power from a diesel engine is almost 35 rupees or let's say a half dollar compared to uh, from solar which is, or electric from a grid which is Seven and a half rupees in India, so it's still point one US dollar cents. This is Tanishir. I think uh, some of very important points came across the LFP, LTO stuff, and all that. 
But now right. these people are given such tight, tight uh, timelines. Uh, uh-huh. If you could, uh, see to wind it up. Yeah, it's more or less over. So this is uh, typically when you do an uh, Roro also, can you do uh, LTO? Uh, fishing boat is another area which can also do solar. Not the large fishing boats, small fishermen boats, which it moves daily 25 to 50 kilometers. So this is another project which we are doing and with Shell Foundation, which can also be economically viable. And some technologies which we are working on just for interest, I just mentioned. So just uh, last uh, important, I wanted to tell about the policy gap which government of India is showing towards electric boats. There is no support like FAME, which you do for EVs, MSME, which are the most manufacturers, and the payment stages and working capital challenges like all MSME. But central government payment terms are equally bad, 80% on completion, etc., which I don't know, maybe bus may work, but in boats is slightly longer period. And the lastly, um, there are one area where they can support is to give an exception for solar board and the shipbuilding subsidy. None of this exists. So there is no policy support at the moment. I hope there is something coming up. So that is all I want to say. So uh, there is a lot of exciting things happening in marine transport. And I hope we can also play a role into it. Thank you. Yeah, I happen to read your uh, blog as well. So I understand the problems. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, hopefully, there will be a question uh, which will ask what is the voltage you work with. So, I hope the audience yes, will sir. talk about it. Now, we'll come to Mr. Arman Arora. He's got an integrated uh, facility and uh, looks like they're exporting again small vehicles. Uh, so, it seems uh, the panel itself. So, he <laughs> might like to articulate uh, why this integrated facility and uh, how is it doing with the uh, light TV. Uh, please go ahead. I think, can you improve the volume in some way? We cannot hear you very clearly. Yeah, a little bit better. Is the mic? Uh... Let me try another way. Uh, Am I audible now? Sir, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, but we seem to be having some technical issues with interpretation. Okay, please, please, please go ahead. Thank you. Is it better? Yeah, this is good. So yes, it is better. It is better. Okay. Go back. Great. So I'll start by a basic introduction about our company. So our firm is SN Solar Energy. And we have been into EV since 2015. And we are doing a wide variety of uh, three-wheelers, more specifically, be it passenger vehicles or load carriers and uh, garbage collection vehicles. And in load carriers, we have multiple options, you know, be it an open carrier with various, uh, with, with again, a variety of load carrying capacity as per the requirement of the end user. Now, we started solar electric vehicles, again, you know, back in 2016 which we started with an export order itself. So, so that was the exciting part for us that, you know, we're starting with EVs and that too with uh, solar integrated vehicles. So I'll, I'll uh, explain more about it in the coming slides. So th- the company was established in 2015 uh, by me and Dr. H.K. Reddy. Dr. Reddy is... Uh, uh, he's an expert in the urban infrastructure and transportation segment. And uh, that's how, you know, uh, we started talking and uh, what we had to do in the urban infra and the transport sector when we thought of starting the EV segment completely. So this is these are certain images of our facility. And uh, I'll just go th- uh, take everybody through the production process first as to what we do and how we do. So first is, uh, you know, we have some in-house machines like laser cutting, turret punch, bending, cutting, which are the most integral part for uh, making a vehicle. Uh, These are the photos of the chassis, as you can see, which are pre-cut to size as per the vehicle. And then they are welded and fixed in fixtures, as we can see in the photos. 
Next are the welding stations. And then you can see the finished chassis. These are the battery boxes or the driver boxes on which the passenger sits. And this is how finished uh, chassis of a three-wheeler look like, looks like. These are the painting booths, finished vehicles, as you can see. Uh, we have two types of facilities. Uh, one is a powder coated facility, powder coating facility, and the other is uh, liquid spray paint. Uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Arora, sir. I, I think we have joined from uh, two devices. So there's a lot of uh, echo going on here. So if you could kindly mute the speakers from one of the devices uh, so that we don't get the echo. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, you have to unmute your mic. Uh, speaker, is that, one is of that the fine now? Could, yeah. Is that fine now? Yeah, 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 I think that's fine. That's fine, Gushagar. I think let's make do with this one slide. Uh, if okay. you could, you know, this is where I think people might be curious about. Uh, yes. We, you know, we got a fairly good idea that you're doing everything yourself. You're creating your own vehicle. But could you get into the technical details here? Like yes. The battery and all of that. Yeah. So, so this is the vehicle, the solar vehicle, which we have made. And this is a three-wheeler. However, this is a low-speed three-wheeler, which can uh, go up to a speed of, say, 25 kilometers per hour and have a six plus one seating capacity, six passengers, one driver. And also, this is a solar panel, which is integrated for 48 watts, 300 watts. Now, the reason why we've gone for this capacity is because of the space constraint. Because this is the maximum that we can go. Uh, next is the battery. Battery, as we can see, it's a 12 volt, 130 AH battery. This is a lead acid battery. Now it's up to us whether we want to use a lead acid battery or a lithium. Because the charging capacity of the solar panel will be similar in both the cases. So this is a solar advantage, which we call the solar savior for the end user. And this is based on practical data that we have collected. So when, as we can see here, that the total running of a rickshaw in a single charge is about 100 kilometers on a good day. With solar, we get 30% efficiency and additional kilometers that we can gain is 30 kilometers. So total distance is 130. Per day income of these people is about 21.67 rupees. Additional income with the help of solar assembly unit is six and a half rupees. You add the savings for additional electric charging, savings from the battery. So net earning comes out to be about 66 rupees. So then you come, when you see on the other side, the overall investment, as we can see, on a ballpark figure is about 23,000 for the solar assembly unit on top of the EV. So the overall break even for the investment return is about 350 days, which is a very big advantage. However, the challenge which we are facing is customer education. Because the customer says that, you know, I don't want to pay extra they don't want to understand the additional advantages that they get. Although we have uh, implemented this system in about uh, 2,000 units, which are running Pan India, uh, which are doing great, and some of the units are running in, in Delhi NCR, for which we have received good uh, feedback from the driver itself. So this is some data on the basis of which we can see the kind of savings. If we have about 10,000 units of solar EVs, you know, which uh, clearly says that we have a saving of 10,000 liters of diesel annually, which is a huge saving for us. So these are the factors. Yeah, I think now we need to conclude this. Uh... Okay. So. This particular slide is uh, very important for us on this day. This is a new vehicle which we have developed. 
the challenge which we are facing with this particular vehicle is the technical know-how for a higher capacity with lower uh, or low space this is an extremely good product for the logistics segment but to solarize it is something that we are working on and which we are looking forward to do how to do I it think, that uh, is the question that we need can i ask you a question before this quiz and answer session uh, sure. the adg isa had said was well, the thing he emphasized on uh, light weighting the vehicle and all of that you know made a big right. point there so what is the weight of the solar panel itself which you have to add the weight is about 25 kg 25 kg that's right. it's glass and is that going to be a problem are you going to look for help from this platform to kind of do something about it or or, or that's fine as it is that's not a problem at all no okay so i think we we'll hear maybe sir as questions we we'll hear the next speaker sure. uh so if perhaps you may have to uh play some video is that how it is Uh, yes, sir. Um, yeah, it looks uh, like the professor, professor Rivera has uh, shared with us a video. Uh, he couldn't okay. join us because of some prior commitment. So I request our IT team to kindly play back uh, his recorded message. Right after that, maybe a couple of questions we can take and move to the next session. Sure, sir. Hello, colleagues around the world. This is Barakat Tasfai from Ethiopia. uh is that only me or oh, okay good yeah good day colleagues uh thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to um uh, present my experiences in in e mobility <laughs> i'm going to be uh, making this presentation uh with respect to the activities at the university of johannesburg where i am employed as a you know so said professor Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Majigira um, and this uh, presentation is going to be uh, quite, quite short um, about 5 to 6 uh, minutes as uh, as requested um i'm going to be uh, doing a brief uh, presentation on the outline that you see on the screen with a special focus on um, new gear related e mobility projects that i've been involved in Uh, not only myself but also some of my colleagues um, are also involved in this and I will present some technical challenges that uh, uh, we have experienced and um, give some closing remarks <clears throat> uh, the the way UJ got involved with e mobility was especially you know with the solar car was through the Sasso solar challenge um, which is quite a grueling you know race uh, from Pretoria um to Cape Town and then along the coast to Durban and back to uh, to Pretoria um which covers i think more than 2000 kilometers so it is quite uh, it's quite a, a grueling journey and uh, the requirement was um, of course to have a, 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 as light as possible um a vehicle um, and the only charging system that we used there was the um, was the sun Uh, and um, uh, of course with some lithium ion battery storage um, but the key point was the optimization of the mass uh, of the uh, of the cam um and then i'm going to touch um, as i go through this uh, project briefly i'm going to touch on our collaboration with the motor invest in botswana where we're trying to build um, an electric car from the ground this is a research platform uh, for e mobility Uh, I also speak um, of my uh, uh, colleagues uh, uh, golf cart uh, Baron Botha is built a very interesting golf cart um, which is also electrically powered um, using batteries uh, and then we've got a current uh, ongoing projects project with um, our students they are converting our Toyota Avanza into electric mobility so this uh, challenge of converting 
in the combustion engine driven car to to electric um is is quite um, interesting but of course i think in the future will become one of the major challenges uh, and i'll talk on the uh, underground uh, mining vehicle that we're interested in we are, we are working on um so when you talk about the ilana it was uh, as i said a competition car you can see in this on the screen here the kind of car that we we developed to again student projects but to minimize weight we had to go with composite material and composite comes with its own challenges one of which was suspension we needed to make sure that we also use um, composite materials for the suspension of the car um, and to add a few master students who, who were involved in this the drive was rear with um, uh, drive motors on the on the on the rear wheels, um, uh, and this car was quite you know successful, um, and I think it participated in quite a number of um, world competitions um, uh, as well. Uh, my colleague here, Nikki Yatsevanbeck, uh, was also the the team leader for this for this particular project. Uh, with the Boto University, we wanted to build something bottom up. So we started off with a, an existing chassis of an existing car so that we didn't have to mess up with the drivetrain. Uh, and then we just um, coupled it to, um, to, to a uh, two kilowatt uh, motor. And it really worked well. We then uh, looked at composite uh, panels for the for the structure. And as we start to upgrade this, uh, it's more of a research platform as I indicated. We are now developing a chassis which integrates the battery storage, especially the using lithium ion batteries, um, so that the chassis becomes part of um, uh, part of the structure. And the beauty about this, the most important thing is that um, you then lower the set of gravity of the vehicle. Uh, so this is another fascinating project that I'm involved in, and this is the project that my colleague uh, Baron Botha has, has worked on, and this is done from his garage. Uh, he has got um, this uh, rear wheel driven single seater um, uh, uh, golf cart. Um, there are quite a few now in golf courses in South Africa where, which are being rented out. And then he developed this um, uh, two seater, which I was uh, testing here. Um, uh, just to get a feel of how it uh, drives and so on, quite uh, quite a powerful piece of um, machinery uh, with two you know rear wheel rear wheel mounted uh, motors. Um, and the current project that our students are working on is converting the Savanza to uh, to electric drive. They just uh, recently finished dismantling uh, the internal combustion engine. Now they are working on designing and selecting the drive motors uh, for this. The biggest challenge with this, as you are going to talk about uh, in, in a minute, is that um, your, your set of gravity changes depending on the number of batteries that you're using and how you're storing them. This is why we want to try to build from bottom up uh, instead of just uh, converting. But converting is obviously a challenge that we're going to face in the um, not too distant future. Uh, and in this project, it is a utility underground mining vehicle, which is um, um, which is uh, being converted by a private company for underground um, uh, mining yeah, usage. And um, this is the inside the engine compartment after removal of the internal combustion engine. Uh, the drive motor is going to be sitting here taking advantage of the existing you know, prop shafts for, for, for the vehicle. Um, and the main challenge now is uh, um, cooling electronics uh, um, and, and so on, uh, because underground um, operation uh, brings those challenges in terms of um, cooling. So I've got um, students who are working on uh, developing the cooling systems uh for 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 this car so in summary as i as i wind up uh, due to time uh, one of the key challenges that you find in a uh, electric vehicles is battery sizing uh, of course the need to have this balance between mass um, and of course range that you can achieve with uh, uh with the car if you are doing a conversion um, the challenge also has to do with the driving dynamics, depending on where you're locating your, your battery packs uh, and so on. Draft train selection, uh, we are looking mainly at two options. Either you have your um, motor mounted on the wheels, on the drive wheels, or you have it uh, integrated into the existing drive system, um, which brings its own challenges as I indicated um, earlier on. Uh, the power conversion and control systems really directly related to the um, uh, management. 
um, the sensitive electronic control systems, your motor control, battery charging control, uh, and the control system. Um, in general, in the battery pack, they need to be uh, cooled down to um, uh, an optimum operating temperature, typically around 60 to 80 degrees. Uh, and of course, weight management goes together with the battery sizing and uh, a port that you're going to be using. Procurement challenges relate to where you can get these components. And what you're seeing here is the, one of the control units for the battery utility vehicle that is going to operate underground. We are designing a cooling system that will then be integrated there to make sure that we're able to get um, the heat away uh, and um, achieve the optimum operating in you know, temperatures. Uh, in this case, we'll be using liquid uh, cooling system to remove the heat. So programming challenges, most of the components that we're using are imported from China. Um, now we're trying to see whether we can have alternative um, supplies um, locally for some of the solar charging, of course, comes with its own, its own issues. In most cases, it's not easy to be able to achieve the full charging using solar, but certainly you can uh, take on uh, take off an auxiliary, you know, energy, you know, requirements for the vehicle using uh, solar panels. So, in short, these are these are my experiences. Uh, I think I've done a little bit over time, uh, but I look forward to uh, more engagement with your colleagues. Uh, on this, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I didn't see any solar panel. I, I, I don't know whether you saw any. So uh, whereas uh, the first piece, if it was available, even if the presentation, it really had. It was a very nice example, Mr. Derasa's talk. Uh, do the organizers have a copy or you don't have? Uh, anyway, we can look for some questions, a couple of questions before we move on. Uh, uh, sir, we do not have a copy of uh, Mr. Duresa's talk. Uh, we have tried to uh, reach out to him, but well, it appears that... His existing presentation, if you have, just one of the nice. While we talk to people, any questions, uh, uh, we could kind of... Uh, so, so just give us a second, sir. Uh, we'll just check. So while we wait for it, we haven't got a very significant question yet. There are some questions about costs and things like that. But then people want you to compare with IC engine, and I don't want to encourage it. But EV would have been different. But comparing with IC engine, this is like uh, putting you at a much bigger disadvantage. So I think what we're looking at is, uh, of course, costs are coming down significantly. It becomes easier to kind of consider solar. But for us, on if, if there is a beautiful example, this is what I wanted to mention, the ADB supported activity at Nepal, where about 150 kilowatts of uh, solar is used for charging, I think 75 vehicles uh, or more. I think 75, two wheel, three wheelers itself, plus about a dozen cars and a few buses, all from solar. And that's a very nice example. I hope things like that can come here. But if we talk about electric vehicles, we will have to get ready and wait for more efficient solar panels. Uh, so we need to get started and things would improve. I don't know, Mr. Harman, what is the efficiency you're dealing with right now? 17, 15%? Is, oh. That's one of the challenges. That's the challenge. What's the efficiency currently? 15, 15 to 17 perhaps, right? Correct. Yeah, that's a big issue. You know, percent, right? More and it's more uh, mileage. 12. 20%, no? It's a 400 watt panel, it's 2 meter square, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what would be the cutoff point where you can start getting delighted that this is possible? 25, 30, what is the thing you think you should achieve? Let's say both the merrier. <laughs> okay, let's see this. Uh, just, just run through it. Where the uh, yes, hold it there. So this is the car. Next one. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, this is the kind of a dimension of the foot you have. It's just on the roof, uh, and you can see this is like a three hundred water. Yeah, there no, anyway. So the car voltage is seventy two. That's the thing. So that's significant. It makes uh, I think it makes sense to go for a low voltage vehicle with this, but definitely it's a car. 
and uh, go ahead. Yeah, four kilowatt motor and it works, right? Uh, so, so that's nice. Next one. So there's another model I think looks a little bit bigger. It's a almost nearly 30 kilowatt. It's a performance car almost. Uh, so battery also has become a bit, little bit bigger. Go on. So these are range extenders and, and that's within possibility. So Evan Aurora also is showing that. Uh, of course, uh, so I think, I think we need to move to the next session since the timelines are very tight. I don't know whether you will remain, but the next session is more about regulations. Maybe if there is time at the end, we could kind of catch on further. So shall we do that? Shall we go to the next session? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, certainly. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, it was a very engaging uh, panel discussion and uh, we'd like to thank all the panelists. Um, I mean, we, we miss Mr. Fitzsum Derisa, but thank you, sir, for giving us a glimpse into uh, his work. And I hand over the floor back to you for the second panel discussion, policy and regulatory landscape. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So I, there are three speakers here uh, from Japan, Mr. Komoto Kechi. Uh, from Mizuo Research and Technologies Japan, who very keen to hear, and my colleague whom I know for a very long time, yes. Sanam Deshpande, Senior Deputy Director. I would rather call him the regulator for EV. That will be easier way to describe him. And then uh, Mr. Barkat Tesfaye, uh, who is, uh, uh, seems to be involved in a whole lot of things in Africa. So we hope to hear, but I think this is a video. So basically we have two speakers, Mr. Uh, Komoto, Kichi, did I say it right? I hope it is right. Yes. Uh, and can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. So thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, Keichi Komoto from Japan. So please uh, let me introduce uh, my activity. Uh, IAP UPS Tax 70. So I'm uh, so now working for uh, Mizuho Research and Technologies, uh, kind of a consulting firm uh, located in Tokyo, Japan. And, and so I'm now organizing uh, the international projects, uh, IAP UK Task 17. So maybe you don't know in detail about the PVPS. So PVPS is uh, one of the uh, technology, technology collaboration program uh, under the uh, IEA. So currently the PBPS uh, has a member of uh, 31, so 26 countries and EU and four associations. So I've heard now India is uh, uh, preparing um, for joining PBPS. So objective of this activity is uh, to enhance international collaborative efforts uh, for PV deployment uh, as a, a cornerstone of the sustainable energy systems. And that uh, uh, PVPS, so we have uh, six uh, projects called the task. So one of them is uh, P task 17 and named uh, PV and uh, transport. So objective of uh, our task is uh, the contribution, contribute to uh, development of PV usage in, in transports uh, in order to uh, reduce CO2 emissions and so on. So now uh, 10 countries um, are joining uh, these tasks. Uh, Japan, uh, myself, is uh, the organizing uh, with uh, France, uh, Ms. Uh, Manuela uh, UTC. From a uh, uh, technical viewpoint, uh, we are focusing on two uh, applications. One is a PV power vehicle, so a PV integrated vehicle. And the other is uh, the PV charging stations. So in other words, uh, EV, uh, EV charging stations using uh, PV. So as for the uh, uh, PV power pickle, VIPV, we uh, developed uh, a technical report uh, last year. So you can access and download these reports on uh, these uh, sites, uh, IAPVPS. Okay. In this uh, study, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, studies uh, focusing on passenger vehicle, uh, commercial vehicle, and uh, large trailer, and so on. Okay. Uh, today, I do not have um, uh, much time. Uh, I will uh, skip in details. 
Uh, so this is uh, the contents of uh, the reports. We had uh, some case studies and the discussion about the solar radiance and uh, next steps. So please access the report. Only one result I, I, I will show. Uh, the, uh, I tried to calculate uh, the how many CO2 emissions could be uh, reduced by pupil vehicle. So we suppose uh, the PV passenger vehicle with uh, one kilowatt PV on roof. Of course, uh, the degree of uh, the uh, uh, impacts is dependent upon the uh, driving pattern and so on. But in many cases, uh, PV power vehicle can contribute uh, to uh, save CO2 uh, emission under the Japanese condition. Uh, uh, more than 200, 200 kilogram CO2 per year per car. And of course, uh, in all cases, uh, the uh, charging frequency uh, could be drastically reduced. In some cases, uh, vehicle can mm, drive uh, without charging uh, at the station. So this is an example of the uh, PV vehicle uh, developed by a needle for demonstrations. So this was a uh, collaborative uh, project uh, with uh, uh, Toyota and Nissan, uh, two big companies in Japan. Yeah. Now these uh, vehicles are driving on public road in Japan, and now uh, some data are obtained and uh, some precise analysis uh, are implemented. So I'd like to show you uh, in our next year, next opportunity, if possible. Okay. And uh, uh, expected, uh, a degree of the benefits, uh, of course, de depending upon the uh, 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 grid condition and so on. Okay. Uh, some uh, outlook. Uh, so people vehicle uh, will provide a uh, solution for passenger tra and transport vehicle. And so as uh, discussed in the previous uh, sessions, uh, right vehicle vehicle is a good uh, uh, application, uh, I think. And uh, as a practical benefit, uh, the PFAS vehicle uh, can offer certain kilometer free solar range. Of course, it's independent upon the uh, condition and so on. But anyhow, the uh, great uh, contribution could be expected. And so especially for short commuting uh, vehicles, PFAS vehicle uh, will provide all electricity for driving. From environmental viewpoints, uh, the uh, um, various kind of environmental benefits, uh, such as CO2 reduction, uh, could be expected. Okay. Of course, uh, the whole country is with a low carbon intensity electricity, and the uh, degree of the uh, CO2 uh, reduction is not big, uh, but uh, the solution for uh, provide, uh, deployment of renewable electricity would be a, a, a significant. Okay. And uh, as uh, economic benefits, uh, the uh, PP price is still. Uh, Expensive for integrating the PV, uh, P integrating big vehicles. Uh, but uh, the uh, drastic cost reduction would be ex uh, expected. And also, some electricity could be delivered uh, for the uh, other, uh, big, other uh, uh, usage. So, big to home, big to grid, and so on. And this could uh, help uh, the economical aspects of PV hard vehicles. And another aspect, uh, the uh, PV power electricity big charging stations. So I will not expect, uh, explain in detail today. Uh, but also you can uh, access uh, this uh, website and download this uh, report. So our activity started uh, three or four years ago. And from this year, uh, we changed the phases for uh, 20, to, uh, 20 to 4 for three years work plan. So currently we are discussing these uh, the items especially for subtask one, uh, focusing on the PV power vehicle. Okay. And so for passenger vehicle and light commercial vehicle and heavy duty vehicle. And also so as discussed, uh, the maybe the uh, uh, three wheeler and so on might be the promising option for PV vehicle. Okay. okay, that's all, thank you so much. Before I, can you remain, sir, before I uh, request Mr. Anand Deshpande. So I'd like to know whether the uh, IESA can influence uh, the IES uh, Task 17 program because solar irradiance maximum happens in tropical, subtropical climates. 
and the vehicles in these areas are small vehicles, really small. And uh, the, we saw today two presentations, both of them are commercial vehicles, they're not trials. Mr. Harman Arora is selling his vehicles and I think Mr. Deresa, he didn't speak, but it looks like he's also, he's also going for a commercial deployment. So these are no more trials. These are low voltage vehicles actually being deployed and it can only be deployed really well only in tropical and subtropical areas. So that doesn't seem to figure in the IEA uh, program. So I, I would request ISA to take it up. There needs to be, because these are, these are not concepts anymore. They're actually on the road, people are selling them. And uh, it so happens in general, uh, the vehicles in the tropical, subtropical areas can be lighter, smaller. They don't even need doors because it's like that. You know, so it's a very, very light construction. The roof is always lighter. So I think this is a very, very important thing we'd like to kind of propose that you please take it up, hopefully, formally, if you take it up. And uh, I would like to request Mr. Deshpande and then together, if there are any questions, you both can address it. Uh, Anandji, are you here? Yeah. Yes, good afternoon. Maybe a little bit louder. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I will share my presentation or the organizers, whether you can share my presentation. Otherwise, I will share my presentation. Uh, yes, sir, we are sharing your presentation, sir. Uh, just give a second, please. So your presentation is on the screen now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will uh, rush through my slides so because time available is less, but uh, I want to give some uh, overview about electric vehicles policy and regulatory landscape. And I will briefly touch upon solar uh, integration and solar power production. Next slide, please. So, uh, sir, uh, we, your voice is a little low. So uh, could you please request you to speak a little louder? Uh, perhaps. Thank you. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir, you're audible, but your voice is a little low. So perhaps maybe you could speak closer to the mic or a little louder, please. Yes. Is it better? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Tony Seba has uh, forecasted that in future, uh, there is going to be clean disruption of energy and transportation. So all of our energy will be provided by solar and wind and all our transportation will be using electric transportation. Next slide, please. Uh, so as all of us we know, electric uh, vehicles are more efficient as compared to IC engine vehicles. So we, we are better utilizing the available resources of energy. Next slide, please. Also the electric vehicle, uh, the number of parts are less, so maintenance is low. Next slide, please. There are a lot of government of India initiatives and policies. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to, there are a number of concerns why government of India is focusing on electric mobility, but the major thrust is because of uh, ample availability of solar, solar power. Uh, in our country, uh, as the Dr. Sajid Mubashir was mentioning, India being a tropical country, uh, throughout the year we get solar power. So if we generate solar uh, power uh, uh, at the grid level and uh, we use electric vehicles, then it is a win-win situation for the country. Uh, uh, so as we are discussing, I was briefly going through earlier presentations. We are still struggling to have good efficiency of solar panels. So actually we can focus on power production using solar and using that electricity for battery electric vehicles. Next point, please. Niti Aayog also uh, the government, uh, government of India's think tank has uh, forecasted that future of uh, mobility in India will be shared electric and connected. Those trends we are seeing. Next slide, please. And because of that, we will be saving a lot of on fuel and also ambient air pollution in our cities. That's why government of India launched national electric mobility mission. 
and under that faster adoption and manufacturing of electric vehicles in the country currently phase 2 of fem india scheme is in uh, progress and it is up to 2024 next slide please uh, there is a fund allocation of rupees 10000 crores which is equivalent to around 1.5 billion dollars uh, out of that major portion is for incentivizing the customers who are purchasing electric vehicles right from two wheeler motorbikes uh, to three wheelers to passenger cars electric buses and commercial vehicles and also significant portion is for the charging infrastructure next slide please and these are the typical incentives available for various categories of vehicles uh, additionally the tax on the purchase of electric vehicles is very low at 5% then there are income tax rebates and there are further uh, these are all federal government incentives and then there are additional state government incentives under their state ev policies next slide please there are also non fiscal incentives for example uh, for driving license age is uh, less uh, for driving electric vehicles then there are no permit required for electric three wheelers then uh, you get some um, priority allocation in parking and also odd even scheme in delhi you can drive on all days of the week when it is polluted in delhi next slide please there are various innovative business models which are coming up for example a battery leads or swappable battery versus fixed battery all our city buses are working on opex model where the uh, transport undertaking is not required to invest in purchase of electric buses but they uh, pay on operating cost multimodal electrical transportation uh, using uh, auto rickshaws three rickshaws or uh, metros uh, and uh, small two wheelers then all delivery uh, companies like uh, 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 like uh, swiggy zomato they are using electric vehicles similarly taxi companies they are ola uber they are using electric feet there are also a lot of electric retrofitment solutions coming up by new startup companies so a lot of innovative ideas are coming up in this space next slide please and i will briefly touch upon what are the standards applicable for electric vehicles next slide so the standards typically focus on verification for the safety electrical safety since we are carrying electricity on board then uh, safety because of water effects electric shock then battery safety uh, vehicle might with, uh, meet with an accident electromagnetic compatibility and some performance parameters like range energy consumption power reliability braking system maximum speed like that. and while you are on this slide uh, do you see any uh, hindrance, uh, anything need to be done or EV, these vehicles, VIV, VIP vehicles can, uh, you know, directly be homologated? Yes, yes. So if uh, electric vehicle is fitted with a solar panel on the roof, so it is a basically electric vehicle. So only the difference is some part of the electric energy is powered by the solar panel. So as long as it meets the regulatory requirements for the technical standards, uh, it can be homologated, it can be type approved. I don't see any hindrance. There is no specific requirement as such for the solar panel fixation or solar panel installation. Uh, internationally, if uh, any such standards are there, I would request the experts over here on this August gathering or the ISA, they can facilitate, uh, we, we can study those standards. But at the any, moment, anything, any any uh, uh, solar panel fitted electric vehicle can be homologated. In, in, anything related to the body crash and all those kind of things. Yeah, it has to meet the current regulatory requirements. So if uh, if it is meeting the performance and safety requirements with solar yeah. panel fitment, it is good enough. Great, I think. Can we, uh, Anandji, go to the yeah. next speaker? I just saw that he's joined. Uh, he was such very nice. And then, you know, there will be questions, we can look at it. Is yes. Mr. Barakat Tesfaye here? Uh, sir, uh, Mr. Tesfaye could not join us today. Okay, uh, so I thought it was a prior engagement, but we'll be playing a, a pre-recorded video message from him. All right, because I can see him on the screen in the list. Yes, uh, sir, he seems to be having some problems with the connectivity, so, so he's just in the listing mode for now. Yeah, then we'll come back. Speakers, question answer. Go ahead. You can show that, but if it is too long, you can kind of do something with the, you know, you, you don't have to show the whole video if it's too long. This one. Uh, it's uh, it's about six minutes, or so we just go to the video.
This is Barakat Tasfai from Ethiopia. I am electric mobility researcher. It's a great honor to be here and share my work regarding the two policy and the regulatory frameworks of electric solar vehicle in Africa context. So for the next two, six to seven minutes, we'll be together. Thank you in advance for your attention. The presentation has five sections. I will go through each of them in a couple of minutes. There are several initiatives going on in Africa, and the most of them are made by students, particularly graduate students and instructors. For example, in South Africa, lecturers and the students at the Johannesburg University managed to build a solar car that participated in Sasol's solar challenge. In Uganda, Kira Motor Corporation managed to build solar-powered electric buses that can travel 300 km with a charge, battery charge, and the additional 40 km with a solar. In Ghana and Kenya, students have also managed the same, as you see in the picture. The second point is stakeholders. In every rollout process, there are stakeholders to be engaged. In this particular solar electric solar vehicle, these sectors are important for the minimum. Most of them are familiar. I would like to give some point on religious clan or community leaders. These are spiritual leaders which have access to, to meet a large, wider community in Africa context. They have the words and the messages that can pass to generations to protect the earth and our environment from vulnerabilities of climate change. If these people are engaged, starting from early stage, their contribution will be substantial. And also important to consider some of the sectors for the rollout process, particularly energy, transport, and the industry. This is to be considered also, there are some critical elements, such as quality leadership, effective collaboration, and commitment, which determines the success of the electric solar vehicles in Africa context. Now, let us, uh, let us have a look at the transport and the auto industry profile, particularly the vehicles. In 2021, more than 1.2 million units are sold, new vehicles are sold, which has an estimated market value of 30 billion USD. This is expected to grow annually by 5.5. Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Ethiopia accounted 80% of imported used vehicles in this year. In general, passenger vehicles accounted 74%, the remaining 26% is commercial vehicles. If we have a look at their industry profile, auto industry profile, only South Africa and Morocco manufactured 90% of the continent's vehicle. As you see from the, the table, South Africa manufactured 500,000, Morocco manufactured 300,000. Had it not been COVID-19, this figure could have been higher. Now let us, have, let us have a look at the emission profiles. In 2021, Africa accounted 40% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, mainly by South Africa, Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria, and Morocco, which accounted more than 90% of this emission. The energy sector accounted 73% of it. 
Now let us have a look at the energy profile. Still, fossil fuels remains the major source of energy supply. Hydropower and the coal are the other major source of supply. There are efforts actually on a transition to renewable energy, especially you will see figures in Kenya and Morocco. Now, having looked the profiles, at least to a certain extent, we can outline the strategic issues before we go to the policy frameworks. So, when we see the weaknesses area, limited financing and the credit facility instruments, limited domestic capacity and the per capita income, weak governances remained the prevalent weaknesses in African countries. There are also traits like currency devaluation, high public debt, war, civil unrest, conflicts, etc. Having analyzed those profiles and some details additionally, we can now see, we can have a look at the policy and the regulatory frameworks. As you see from the table, almost all countries have a target on electric vehicle rollout. For example, Kenya looks for up to 5% of its newly registered vehicles will be made in 2025. And South Africa looks for up to a cost parity between the traditional vehicle and the electric vehicle between eight years to 10 years time. We will see a lot of incentives, both physical and non-physical. Those who manage to provide several incentives have the highest chance of attracting investment. Finally, the way forward. Depending on the country's context and the stage of EVs rollout, the following points can be considered to facilitate rollout of the solar vehicles. First, identify the key stakeholders in solar e vehicle ecosystem. Second, establish an inclusive wide sector coordination unit or working group. Develop feasibility study to analyze and choose better options. For address strategic issues and minimize risks, those outlined in weaknesses areas and the threats. Develop a comprehensive roadmap and conduct a series of consultation with all stakeholders before the final output. A review or develop laws to align with solar electric solar vehicle requirements. Develop operational plan. Monitor and evaluate the results periodically. I'm not sure whether I can agree to that roadmap. Any participants have anything to say about roadmap? Because I'd like to kind of take a few minutes on that. I really don't think this roadmap is uh, a sensible one which was presented now. So anybody would like to say something? We don't have too many questions. If there is any panelists who want to say something, let's go ahead. Or uh, I'd like to draw attention to this, you know, like, a few years ago, a professor, an Indian professor working in the United States, he came and he had an active project. He said he can have an electric rickshaw uh, without any kind of a charging. He can only charge off from the roof like the one Mr. Harman Arora has. And he said this is going to cost something like the project will cost something like three crores Indian rupees. That would be in dollars. I was just trying to look. It's slightly under. Four thousand, uh, you know, four hundred thousand dollars, and the output is one e-rickshaw. It will never have to charge. It can, it can run off, uh, you know, just the solar. So, so that is very, very new, novel kind of uh, solar thing. I don't know what Mr. Harman's costs are. If you would like to venture, you could kind of tell us what is the cost if your electric rickshaw is. Uh, but what I want, oh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Not able to hear. Uh, 
Okay, I'd like to make a point here that uh, Mr. the ADG uh, ISA, Mr. Philip had talked about lightweighting. Now lightweighting is partly through design. You could have a space frame structure, partly through aluminum, and uh, like the solar panels can look different. So since there are active uh, people like Deresa in, in Ethiopia, and Mr. Harman who's got active vehicles here, there may be more people. I think uh, the ISA could consider if it is, uh, you know, you could look at it, a program to assist in these goals which you've set, light weighting of light electric vehicles and bringing in appropriate solar kind of structures, which is not good, which would be crash proof and things like that. Maybe not uh, not using glass. So if, if that kind of a thing is possible, I think we would have made a big contribution. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to the organizers because these student projects, all, all right, but there will be N number, every university will have a student project. Uh, but that is not something you can really work with. Whereas if we, when we get these kind of manufacturers who are already out there by themselves working things out, it may be worthwhile considering putting them together into some kind of a consortium and they're from different countries, all the more better, uh, but in the tropical areas. So that's all from me, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, this has been a very enriching and engaging discussion and with a very diverse panel. And thank you, sir, reflecting on your vast experience, your expertise in this sector. I mean, it speaks for itself. And you have given us a direction on the way forward in terms of what the ISA can do, what our programmatic focus needs to be. And on that note, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Ugochukwo Ugbo. Um, uh, Chief of Unit uh, for the Knowledge Management and Institutional Development Cluster at the ISA Secretariat uh, for uh, uh, summing up today's discussion and giving us a... Uh, sorry, uh, so sorry for the technical glitch. And, and giving us a direction in terms of where the program on scaling solar e-mobility and energy storage would move moving forward. O over to you, sir. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chagra, for, for, uh, uh, for, for moderating the session, and also uh, Sajid, too, for moderating uh, the technical sessions as well. Uh, from ISA's perspective, mm -hmm. I'd like to respond uh, by presenting some steps for, in terms of the way forward that we see from, from ISA. Now, um, I know that uh, we've, had, we've had several presentations on the technical and, and, and uh, the policy aspects of e-mobility, but I thought it's also necessary to give a more, a broader picture of, of where the program lies amongst, amongst the, uh, the nine programs of ISA. So I'll just quickly go through some of the programs that we have and then focus specifically on the, on the e-mobility and and storage aspect. So to attain SG7 and uh, SG13, which is combating climate change goals, ISA's uh, nine programs are as, as follows. We have scaling, solar applications for agricultural use, affordable finance and scale, scaling solar mini grids, scaling rooftops, solar parks, heating and cooling systems, solar PV, battery and waste management, Solar for green hydrogen. Of course, this is this um, this webinar focuses on, on scaling solar mobility and capacity, and it's part of capacity building for doing so. At the same time, we also have storage, as we've heard, lies in the fulcrum for decarbonizing the transport sector. Okay. So, in terms of the program itself. Um, we have some key developments, which, which I'll talk about, and then some next steps, particularly focusing on, on e-mobility, right? And this addresses uh, Sajid's question about, about uh, you know, how we could, how we could uh, um, work with others on the one hand, and how we could facilitate implementation of some of these uh, ideas. Many of them have been articulated in this, uh, in this webinar. The first is the solar e-mobility, uh, the solar EV report, which we launched in COP27 this year. That, that would have several 
uh, several inputs, which will be listed within the next steps. Uh, we also have a guide for energy storage. As you know, energy storage is something which, like I said, is key for decarbonizing transport systems as well as uh, decarbonizing in general. There are also some technical cooperation missions which we plan to have in member states. Of course, we are in talks with Nigeria currently, and uh, we'll certainly be working with some of the panel members here to articulate some of the interventions that can occur uh, in some member states. Now, like I said, with the solar EV reports, one of the next steps which we are, which we are planning to achieve are to assess readiness levels of member countries for solar e-mobility pilot projects. Like I said before, I say unlike I say differentiates itself from many other international organizations in this space by being more um, action oriented. So, so we want to end up with some with some uh, pilot projects that could also uh, support uh, policy and uh, and guidance later on. Then we also have a roadmap for uh, for solar immobility and energy storage systems. We're also working with, with, uh, in consultation with member states to identify uh, front runner countries in immobility. We we'll also run a technical workshop where, we'll, where some of the panel members from this, from this uh, webinar, as well as the previous webinar, will be invited to, to share their thoughts and perhaps we'll be provide some guidance and policy on the way forward for, for some of the countries that, that we've identified as, as front runners. And then we also have a pilot projects, wonderful pilot projects for solar immobility, which includes both charging stations and battery swapping. And this will include some support in terms of uh, pilot technical design concepts. And here we'll be working with, with, with a vast, with, with, uh, with several different um, stakeholders. Some of them are listed here. We have IEA, and I'm happy that they're part of the panel here working with the EU and DST. So I think this answers some, some, some challenges that you put on, on us uh, um, during this, uh, during this uh, webinar. And again, we're also going to be studying long duration energy storage systems. As, as a side note, it's clear that, that, uh, that uh, um, storage is something is absolutely central, both for, both for um, solar immobility as well as for charging as well. So I think um, going into, now I want to talk about capacity building. Of course, nothing is going to happen without, without having the corpus of human capital that can enable a lot of these ideas. So capacity building is also part of our portfolio. In this regard, this is just a scorecard showing what, what ISA has achieved in terms of capacity building in general. But of course, e-mobility is, is a new and upcoming subject. So we hope to to also include immobility as one of the uh, one of the uh, the capacity building programs in the future. Right. So in this in this regard, um, we have we have I just I just go through some, some of the new capacity building uh, initiatives. We have Star C, which which uh, which will be uh, launched um, with Ethiopia. That's one of the first countries, and then follow it up with other countries. We we'll have also um, we also aim to have at least four thousand stakeholders trained by by twenty twenty four. We're going to be launching the idea of the ISEMA Masters Program and Continuous Professional Development Program. We we'll also enhance uh, the use of uh, fellowships as well as other other key initiatives. So with that, um, I'd like to hand back over to, to Kushaga, who has been doing a, an excellent job mm -hmm. in this session. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can, you can take this further. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for providing us a brief overview of uh, uh, ISA's program on scaling solar mobility and storage. And as you have rightly pointed out, ISA remains committed to supporting its membership with uh, uh, a, a policy and regulatory ecosystem readiness and uh, capacity building initiatives through uh, through platforms such as this, as well as technical workshops that we conduct with our member countries and technical missions. Uh, and with this note, I think we have come to the end uh, of this uh, 
uh, fabulous session. And uh, I would now like to request uh, Dr. Mridula Bharadwaj, who is an expert on energy storage at the ISS Secretariat, uh, to kindly uh, provide us with a word of thanks. What do you, ma'am? Thank you, Kushak. And dear friends, we had uh, enriching discussions on various aspects of vehicle integrated PV sector. And as you know, this is still an evolving area, and hence the speakers provided a very diverse perspective of the engineering, economic, policy, and regulatory aspects. Um, we plan to organize a series of webinars in this area. And today was the second one. First one, as uh, Dr. Hugo mentioned, was done a few months back. Uh, we are grateful to um, His Excellency DG Aysa, Dr. Ajay Mathur, for encouraging us to initiate this webinar series. And we also appreciate ADB's support to the ISR Secretariat and its programs. And now on behalf of the International Solar Alliance, I thank all our distinguished speakers and panelists for their valuable time and for sharing their expertise in this very new evolving segment of e-mobility. Now we are um, highly encouraged by participation, as you know, from the honorable national focal points and government representatives from ISA member countries. Um, thank you all for uh, participating. The country missions in New Delhi and stakeholders from industry, think tanks, as well as academia. We deeply value your interest and look forward to a sustained engagement in the future. Um, in the end, I sincerely thank Dr. Sajid Mubashir, who very kindly agreed to be our moderator. And uh, his expert moderation really helped the panel steer in the right direction. A big thank you to Dr. Ugo and Dr. Malbranch, our um, internal mentors and providing leadership to our program. And of course, thanks a lot to ISA colleagues for their excellent coordination and support to organize this webinar, especially our IT team and communication teams. Um, I'll also like to especially thank my colleague, uh, Kushal Nagaic for anchoring this webinar. We close the webinar now. Uh, thank you all. Thanks a lot. Yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, may I request uh, all our panelists to kindly turn on their cameras so that we can have a good photograph? Take my nice picture. Yeah. Uh, Rajinder, please let me know when we have the photograph. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, thank you again to all our speakers and many, many thanks to Dr. Sajid Mubashir, sir. Uh, it was wonderful and uh, we look forward to working with you all again uh, in the future and, uh, and count on your guidance as you move forward in the program. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you.